I was actually here last year at September, and then I was a payment security advocate coming to talk about my concerns in the cloud. And a lot has changed in the last year, and now I'm standing in front of you as a cloud security advocate talking about my concerns about payment data in the cloud. So it's very, very similar in, in that history. And, and the reason I have that concern is because so much is moving so quickly. As a result of the pandemic, we see that financial institutions are going from zero to 100 miles an hour to go from no longer just toying with and exploring should we be investing in, in going all of our digital assets or going to digital assets in the cloud to the fact that we are now, uh, according to McKinsey, uh, they had a report that said, uh, today there's about 13% of financial institutions that have more than half of their assets and their operations in, in cloud services. But they project by 2027 that that will more than uh, triple, be more than 54% of uh, financial institutions will have a majority of their operations in cloud services. So today I'm going to do a very quick uh, overview of what CSA is looking to have you involved with in order to have a new type of approach for education and awareness and assurance for essentially financial service activities of all kinds, and we'll define what that is in a moment, uh, within cloud computing. So we'll go over some of the growth in this area and then the, uh, the third uh, item is actually our roadmap. What is CSA looking forward to uh, doing in, in the future? And before we go forward to looking at financial services, uh, we have to understand where they're coming from because there's a very long history of securing financial services. And right now we're in this very messy stage of, of how we go about and migrate this big lift and shift that people like to, to say, and, and so we have to understand that history in order to project where we're going to go. On the, on the screen here, um, not only do I have a history with CSA, I also have a history to this area of the country. Uh, so in the picture is my great-grandfather uh, in 1907. He was um, immigrated to this area. He was the first man to drive a car in uh, Olympic Peninsula, which is about 100 miles west of Seattle. And so, and, and my family's been out there ever since. Uh, and he came, and he came from Europe because no one at the time, this is before Henry Ford had rolled out cars. Uh, this is a time when few people knew how to operate cars or the rules of navigating cars and also how to maintain them. So he was, he was brought in from Europe to uh, take around some of the more wealthy families. If you're familiar with Bouchard Gardens, if you're local to the area, uh, this was the, these were the, actually the Ricksons, but he was a chauffeur for the uh, Bouchards as well. And I think that's where we are at cloud, is we have too few people that really truly know how to operate and maintain these type of environments. We don't quite understand all of the financial service implications and the regulations for how do we manage that. And then going forward, we don't have necessarily all of the technology as perf perfected as we want today in order to have safe operations. So as I was looking at what we can do for financial services, I was looking at the mission of CSA itself. And for me, it really came down to four pillars that, that CSA does very well. And the first is, is education and awareness. We have our, our certificates of knowledge, we do summits, we have September, we have all these ways in which we are able to have a platform for, for information. And then we also are good at helping to really secure the cloud. We have all these hundreds and hundreds of research papers. We have our threat and vulnerability reporting. And all of this leads to empowerment for CISOs and others that are, are making investments into that environment. We have the uh, star registry, we have the CCM uh, mappings, so we can say in my field, if it's healthcare and high tech, uh, PCI and, and, and payments, we have a way to have some type of, of mapping and empowerment that I can go ahead and possibly bring on these third parties. And then I also really love the advisory services. Uh, I've spoken to, I think, four or five of the uh, major banks here in the United States just in the last six weeks about their plans of, of migrating to the cloud. And, and, that, and 
opportunity uh, presents itself here at CSA. And then finally, the ability of assurance. So we have the, the STAR registry, so you can actually go and have transparency in that practice. So you can see that service providers have gone through the effort of looking through what could be required of them from their third parties. And then we have, obviously, uh, industry collaboration and, and alignment across the world as well. So when I think about uh, this and, and all of these, these points of data, we see that truly trillions and trillions of dollars are being uh, processed over the cloud today. We have to understand that that, that is, is a significant amount of then incentive for criminals. So if, if you're familiar with the urban legend of Willie Sutton, he was a uh, old time bank robber, and they asked him, Willie, why do you rob banks? He said, well, that's where the money is. Same is now true for the cloud. That is where the money is going and, and is today. We see the, the market size for crypto. Um, dis, despite being in this crypto winter and all the volatility, we're still talking about the equivalent of tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars um, that, that are available. We talk about banking as a service and all the many different ways that that is being um, uh, commercialized. We also talk about uh, e-commerce. Now, this year in 2022, they're projecting that uh, e-commerce transactions will, for, for the first time, exceed half a trillion dollars. Um, and so we start to see this broad adoption and, and large amounts of money, which leads to uh, some of these uh, attacks. And if you look at the Verizon data breach report, I liked what was said uh, earlier today or, or yesterday from the IBM data re uh, breach report that came out this summer. That if you look at all of the uh, uh, ways that people are being compromised, half of those lead are from compromised credentials, phishing, and cloud misconfigurations. So we have to think about how we're going about um, actually improving all of these uh, fin as a service. And one of the things that I've been passionate about is around PayFAC as a service. So if you're not familiar, PayFAC stands for Payment Facilitators. Uh, these are truly software developers that have in the last four, five, six years been able to uh, be part of this broader ecosystem and previously they were really, a lot of the hardware and other types of technologies prevented it. Uh, so I'm talking about the likes of Stripe, uh, Square, not their dongle, but some of their other services, uh, PayPal, and those types of organizations. So those three, in fact, just those three represent about $2 trillion, $1.89 trillion today of, of processing. And, and going forward, we have a projected 2,000 of these types of organizations that say, hey, I can write code. I can, I can do some type of a bank as a service. And so there's projected in the next two years that we're going to have essentially more than 2,000 SaaS providers, essentially, uh, doing some type of, of financial management in the cloud. But a lot of those folks don't understand the regula regulatory implications that come with that. So I have to then uh, start to explain who are financial services? What is financial services? Uh, how is financial services? If uh, maybe some of the younger folks in the room don't know, uh, that was a pretty funny joke in my head. Uh, but there's all these different ways that we are um, trying to identify with financial services. We have neobanks. Uh, so if people aren't familiar, neobanks, those are essentially banks that exist. They are, as, as of 2020, they are starting to get FDIC approval. And they are uh, essentially, uh, they have no physical premise, uh, no physical location. And so we're starting to see the regulatory bodies starting to accept these type of, of uh, entities. We see retail and commercial banking, uh, payment networks, credit unions. We have, if we go into the fintech world, just dozens and dozens of categories of, of representation of what that might mean. And then not to exclude uh, cryptography and uh, the, the crypto market, we have all not just crypto exchanges and cryptocurrencies themselves, but it really has become an ecosystem of hundreds and hundreds of organizations that are really cloud native applications and cloud uh, pro cloud environments for the most part. 
In addition to all of these categories of financial services that would benefit from some of our research, we also see that there are many organizations out there and groups of and categories that we should be reaching out and working with, partnering with, uh, sharing information, having them share information with us as well. So that includes financial associations. Uh, you see some of the ones that I, I've worked with in the past, the American Bank Association, my former uh, company, PCI, we see crypto exchanges, and not only just crypto exchanges, but then we have all these standards bodies, like the center that is, is producing crypto standards that have cloud relevant uh, requirements. We see software development community. I talked about some of the smaller payfacts, but we also recognize that many of the larger software developers have entire uh, groups of payment development that, that is happening. We see a lot of soft pause that's being accepted today. And then the regulators, looking to ways that they're trying to start to uh, get their hands around recognizing the financial incentive that is happening and how do we start to uh, control that and manage that. Uh, law enforcement, we have Interpol, Europol, SACA, all these different types of organizations out there. Uh, we saw recently that uh, the FBI has created a digital asset uh, group that's essentially going after all these criminals that are stealing crypto data uh, or cr cryptocurrency and trying to uh, tr um, bring it back. We see the UK has put in a bill to propose the same type of, of law enforcement agency. These are types of groups that we should be working with and discussing and collaborating with. Uh, and then not to mention insurance and brokerage and all these other types of uh, ACH, clearinghouse, all these types of uh, different types of financial data that exist and they're all moving. This is, this, I know in this room and in this, this uh, Cloud Security Alliance has been around for well over a decade, but for the financial services industry, you have to understand a lot of this is brand new within the last two, three, four years to even consider a major migration this way. So as I was talking, uh, I, I had interviews with about 30 financial institutions, fintechs, uh, people that I previously just identified as, as financial services. Um, I interviewed them and, and it came down to really three areas of pain points. So they said, this is what has stalled our adoption to uh, the cloud. This is what is, we're working, we're, we've had senior leadership say, no, you're moving into the cloud, but this is what still uh, bothers us. And it came down to data management, third-party assurance, and regulatory changes. And what do I mean by this? Well, uh, data management, it was essentially the isolation of data from other unknown sources. It's something that is, is you know, it's, it's the basic root uh, type of focus for someone that's doing a PCI assessment or, or something with, with financial data. They said the misconfiguration for and, and least privilege is something that you see with, with some of the recent bank uh, compromises. If you're familiar, I won't name names, but if you're familiar with, with some of the major uh, compromises where more than 100 million uh, customers have lost data, uh, financial data, that was due to a misconfiguration. We have confidentiality, but not just confidentiality, it's also the changing uh, climate for that. So today we rely almost exclusively on uh, in, in, for many environments for encryption. Well, we recognize, and it's been talked about several times today, I think Rich mentioned it in his, his talk this morning, we are in the process, we're in this messy history of moving in the next five to 10 years or, or longer into post-quantum cryptography. And what does that mean for all these organizations that have relied so heavily and exclusively on encryption? And at the same time, they also see the benefit in this area of automation and AI, the ways that we can actually move and scale more rapidly to do some of these changes. I liked what uh, Sean Harris also said yesterday about infrastructure as code and, and the ways that we can have such quick and, and the velocity of which we can push out some of these type of changes. The second is around third-party assurance. And looking at this continuous inventory for all sources, I, I can't remember who was speaking about it, but I did hear SBOM thrown out this week. Uh, it's one of the biggest challenges I think uh, most people are trying to get their heads around. We have the executive order 1428 uh, for President Biden. I know that, that the UK has, has considered uh, similar type of legislation where we're looking at, you need to have a full accountability of and know who your supply chain is because we have all these threats. We have uh, solar winds that gets thrown about, around a lot. Uh, by the way, I, uh, I really struggle with that because uh, we talk about log4j and solar winds and these, these certain instance 
but we don't realize that of all this open source code that exists today, so, so if you go to um, your CVD database and look at what open source code today has vulnerability, there's uh, well over 2,000 uh, known uh, vulnerabilities in much of the popular open source uh, code. And only 3.3% of all of those vulnerabilities today have been weaponized. So just because we're picking on you know, Apache struts and log4j and, and certain uh, code, we have to realize there is a lot of open source dependencies out there today that just haven't been exploited. The other challenge they have with third party assurance, uh, and I could verify this because I was a software developer in the 90s, documentation. No one wants to actually uh, go about uh, having a very clean and, and consistent uh, form of, of documentation. The other is the cost and value of the assessment. So understanding that, that there's a cost associated for these SaaS providers and those that are prov providing these services, uh, they said the challenge is the cost to, uh, to go through the procurement process to be able to vet thousands of these organizations, and then for those organizations on the reverse side, for them to pay for these $10,000, $15,000 audits for 15, 20 different uh, financial institutions. And last, they talked about all of these are, are, are part of that delayed adoption of fintech services. We have, the last is around a re regulatory change and understanding that there is a growing number of compliance frameworks that, that are being developed and how do they go about meeting this. Uh, there's been challenges with data localization. Uh, I can't remember, I think it was uh, Phil Venables this morning that was talking about data localization and the challenge we have uh, with countries that are starting to say, none of our data is going to leave our country borders. So you see Russia and China have already put these laws into place. India had a law this summer that they just withdrew, uh, so the, the, but they're still considering it. Europe, uh, European Union has, has considerations for this as well. So they're understanding, can my CSP actually be able to accommodate if all of a sudden um, I'm forced to have more localization of all data that's being uh, processed in that, in that country? And then we have a digital currency. So I, I just went to a crypto conference, and when I said, I can't see your eyes, so I don't know if you're rolling your eyes when I say cryptocurrency or not, uh, but cryptocurrency, despite where it is in its volatility right now, the reality is, 91% of central banks around the world uh, are actually have invested heavily in the research for a stable coin, some type of central digital currency. So the reality is whatever happens with the, those types of crypt cryptocurrencies that are not tethered to a, to a fiat, um, we have to recognize that, that there is uh, tens of millions of dollars being invested in, in this. And by the way, a majority of that is thinking about being applied in cloud environments. And then the last one I, I just skipped over, but it, the investment inquiries as well. So when there is an investigation, when an organization has to demonstrate uh, that they are, are in a process of whatever the, the reason, especially with serverless environments, they say that there's a real fear and concern that if I'm operating in these serverless environments, that I'm not going to be able to actually demonstrate good uh, uh, due diligence on my part uh, through my CSP. So just breaking down the data governments uh, just slightly a little bit more, uh, two areas that I wanted to highlight uh, on the confidentiality. One is around HSM and, and key management. So it's not just the protection and confidentiality of the data, it's also the key material, it's also all those things that create that integrity and that, and that trust. And so finding ways that we can um, uh, protect those type of, of things. We have access integrity, the Capital One as a, one example of, of you know, recognizing that it could be just a rogue employee uh, puts things in the S3 container and it's out there and all of a sudden uh, you have uh, really questions about the, the how do they have that access and be able to, to um, give it away so freely. We have also consistency in that, that availability. Uh, I thought it was a really good conversation around the need for BCP yesterday in, in, uh, in some of the CXO trust advisory, but also today we were continually talking about um, ransomware, and that's, that's the word du jour, but the reality is it's not going away. It continues to grow year over year. That's the statistical data of it. And in fact, I was talking in one of these interviews, uh, I had a, a large financial institution say, I no longer worry about the old days of st 
someone stealing financial data and then repurposing it for fraud. It is all about ransomware. It is such an incentive for, for people to go after an attack. Um, that's, that's where we're putting all of our investment going forward. The other uh, area is third parties. And it came down to three um, areas that they said we really like to see an improvement. One is on education. So they said there's a knowledge gap with those of their own teams and the practitioners saying they don't understand quite uh, you know, how, how to go about implementing uh, cloud. We also saw that on the flip side, those that are providing cloud services really struggling with understanding of, of regulatory compliance and, and why a financial institution would want to ask for certain type of requests. In the transparency, uh, there was a consistency with, with multi-party recognition. We have John D. Maria standing at the back of the room. If, if you don't know John, he is our leader of our, our STAR program, and uh, we've talked about this a lot, but there is a, a need in the industry to have a very clear way to say, I am doing the same type of control validation but I need to do it and demonstrate it for 10, 20 different entities. Uh, we have to find ways that, that we can consolidate that and make it more efficient for everyone. Also, the need and, and recognition of continuous compliance. I was just at a CISO event two weeks ago where uh, at, at, we had a CISO that said, it is so hard for me to work with my cloud service provider because I am always in an audit. So they are continuously getting from me a request. And they said, I, I just did this request for you two weeks ago. I said, no, I, it's a new audit, constantly doing that type of, of issue. Right, so I'm, look, I'm, I'm running behind, so I'm gonna speed this up just a little bit. Um, and the third is, is around ac accountability and looking at, at third parties and then also um, really truly leveraging our shared security responsibility model. That is something that people say, it's a great model, it just so far has been poorly executed in, in the marketplace. And then of course, uh, the last risk around legislative, we have banking regulation, so banks, we have Bank Secrecy Act, we have FIC, we have uh, Federal Reserve, we have all these different types of, of regulations that it doesn't matter that they were on-prem and are going to the cloud, there's still this expectation from those type of auditors that there's gonna be good faith and demonstration of security. We have the complexity of all the different data security uh, models. I, uh, if anyone wants to lecture me on, on PCI afterwards, uh, it's fine, but I assure you I'm no longer with the PCI Council, so, so I, I'll just have a beer with you and shake my head in agreement. Uh, we have privacy issues, so we have CCPA, we have so many states that are starting to try to inject their own uh, version of a state law for privacy. I mentioned data localization and sovereignty, uh, and then and digital currency as well. So, now we get to the good stuff. Now we get to, uh, really the last two slides are, are uh, why I'm glad you, glad you all didn't walk out on me, is what is CSA going to be doing next? So first, I, I think we need to be doing what we do well. And that's those four pillars that I, I mentioned earlier. But we need to expand and look at different targets. So today, a lot of our focus and our education is on uh, those practitioners that are responsible specifically for providing uh, the cloud security to their own organization. I think within those large organizations, especially in FinTech, especially in financial services for SaaS providers, it's also providing those types of, of techniques and metrics and, and ways of going about showing and demonstrating third party assurance as, as well and governance and, and regulation. Uh, also grow awareness. So, so I've been, uh, I've done several things myself over the years with CSA, and in fact last September, uh, Jim Rivas and I did a, a press release uh, between the, the two organizations, uh, but then when I became an employee of CSA, my mind was blown of the 345 or whatever it is, uh, research papers of the thousands of people that have, have registered for the STAR program, um, and there's probably many people like me that are familiar with aspects of CSA, but not necessarily familiar with all aspects of it. So grow the awareness of the people that know some, and then grow greater awareness for those that, that are, are brand new and don't know what CSA is. So this comes down to going back to our, our four pillars where I, I think CSA excels so well is 
in the education pillar, looking at industry-specific training uh, for protect for practitioners, looking at micro trainings, uh, some of the, looking with other organizations that provide specific industry sector training and being able to uh, provide either cloud expertise to their training or, or provide other ways that, that CSA can accommodate that gap in the, in the market today. Look at for uh, summits with regulators and those that are influencers in, in cloud. And then one of the things that I'm excited about that uh, Jim Rivas is, is uh, having us work on uh, right after this, I think it's right after this uh, conference, I had to start working on it, yeah, uh, is a financial services report. And this will be something that we work with the industry so that we're starting to collect where are the pain points for all these different types of financial services, and then how do we go about uh, uh, providing tools, providing education, providing things that will actually improve and, and minimize those pain. And then for SECURE, looking at some specific research opportunities, we're looking at uh, some use cases for every financial institution that I talked with, um, I really don't want to hear lift and shift anymore. I think I heard that uh, too often in all my conversations. But there really was a need for tabletop exercises for these banks, very large banks, Fortune 50, Fortune 100 banks saying, can you tell me how my peers are doing this? Because you know we're doing a lot of exercises internally. It would be great to collaborate and have some information sharing. Um, also, one of the areas that I, I'm interested in is uh, HSM as a service. So finding ways that we create uh, HSM is if is a very heavy dependent um, control for protecting the key management and financial transactions of all kinds. And so finding ways that we can have greater confidence by regulators and those that, that are looking at the integrity of moving from a very black box HSM to something that is within cloud services. And then also, uh, I'm interested in the global security database. Is there ways that we can take the knowledge extracted from that? Can we work with FSISAC? Could we work with other organizations that have uh, some form of intelligence for the banking and fintech communities? Can we find ways that take that and, and share it with our members at, at CSA? For empowerment, I think the procurement process, we're working on some pilots in, with, with bank entities around how can we get better information for, for CISOs, for those third-party SaaS providers, also for cloud service providers and those SaaS providers, can we provide better transparency, whether it's through our STAR program or through some other type of, of means to show the due diligence that they're taking. And then also helping the regulators um, understand and agree upon best practices so that we can actually start to leverage some of the good work that's done by CSA. And then finally, look at the assurance uh, for the mappings that we have. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, there is a recent mapping that we did with the Cybersecurity Risk Institute, CRI, uh, to the CCM. Uh, that is a, an organization that is, is uh, represented by uh, dozens of, of major banks, or specifically mostly here in the U.S., but, but globally. And then also looking at other ways that we can map. Uh, we were about to release uh, some other work and in, in also financial sector related that, that I think will help with, uh, with some of that assurance. And then also the STAR registry. Are there ways that we can look at how we go about listing and providing a global database, a global repository for all of these type of financial service third parties, and can we provide a way for, for CISOs of banks, for CISOs of fintechs, to have better and higher confidence uh, of, of those that they work with. So all of this leads to, uh, essentially, we need you. Uh, we need you to help shape and participate in our upcoming surveys. Uh, we need help in volunteering. We have a financial services working group, if you're not familiar. Uh, we are re-looking at the, the charter. Eric Johnson is, is here. You can speak with him if you're interested in, in that working group. Uh, we have Alex. I think I saw Alex uh, in the room here today. Uh, also, that, that you can speak with them and, and be part of this uh, new initiative. 
We also are going to have a financial services summit. Uh, it'll be in the first quarter of next year. Uh, it's gonna be two full days. It'll be online. It'll be similar in format to if you're going to attend the Zero Trust uh, Summit in, in uh, November. It's gonna be similar to that format, uh, but I'm really excited. We have some, some big name CISOs that are going to share their experience of, of moving from on-prem uh, financial environments to, to, uh, to the cloud. And then uh, last, we're here. Uh, we're here for the next two days, today and tomorrow. Uh, please seek myself out, uh, seek some of the, the colleagues that, that I, I mentioned and, and anyone here with the CSA staff badge because we'd happy to discuss where we can take all of these different initiatives that I just ran through in over 30 minutes. So I apologize for, uh, for that over skill. With that, I will uh, just say thank you. I appreciate it. Let's go make some history.